Hi, I'm Stacy, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I have prepared a state machine for a UART transmit and I will give you some tips and tricks regarding state machines and the way I think about state machines when I'm writing them. So I've got my PC here. So the first thing I do when the data is valid and when I'm ready, I load in the data, store it in memory because this is a synchronous process. So at this point, I don't even have to know or care where TX data ready is being driven. I don't know how that signal is being driven, but I know when I'm ready and when it's valid, I'm cool to load data. So looking at this chunk of code, I have all the information I need to know. I know that I have data and I have valid and I'm ready so I can load. And so you want it to be that all the information that you need to understand the code is presented as clearly as possible. So in this case, I don't even have to care about how I'm driving ready. All I know is that I'm ready and there's valid data. Therefore, I can load the data into my intermediate buffer variable. And the reason why I have this is because maybe the valid will go low the next clock cycle, right? It's only valid for one clock cycle and then it's going to go low the next one. And so I need to be able to say, oh, I need to keep you for later because I don't want to start processing and chugging out my TX bits and then suddenly the input signal that I received changed and now I don't have it anymore. And then I've got my constants that are useful in my state. Here I do a little bit of calculations. I calculate the board rate and the counter sizes and those are based off these parameters. So I specify how many bits my word is, my board rate and my clock rate. So I have two counters. I have a counter that's counting the board rate because my clock rate's 100 megs and I'm not doing 100 meg UART. Second, I'm counting my data bits because when my data bits are done, then I want to move on to my stop bit. And they are named data counter and board counter. And this is the calculation for their values. And again, all of the information I need to evaluate this code is right here. When I'm reading it, I can say, oh, okay, my board counter max is my clock rate divided by my board. So all of those variables are appropriately named such that anyone who's reading it can go, oh, I know what that value is without even caring where it was assigned or how or what value it is. I can look at this and be like, huh, this makes sense. If I made a mistake in this code and I put multiply instead of divide, then someone who's reading it can go, hold on, that's not the right formula. Okay, so now we do my counters. I'm just counting every single clock cycle, I increment the counter. Instead of specifying a maximum for my board rate counter here, I could say board counter is greater than my maximum, and that would be perfectly fine. But what I could also do, and this is actually a really, really cool trick when you have this state, current state and next state, is you could literally just say, reset the counter on the state change. And I do this all the time. It is such a neat trick. You don't even have to think about the counter. If you have a counter and you know you need to reset it on the state change, you don't have to think about what number goes there. And I'm not tying that reset to a max value. I'm tying that reset to the state machine itself. And that means that if I decide that the state needs to be a bit longer, it doesn't matter. I just do the state change later and the counter resets appropriately. And then this is just a flag indicating it's done. So here is the comparison where I say it's done. And so I compare my counter with the max. And that is enough. I don't need to bake the comparison into the counter mechanism. I can just do a state change and I'm good. So then this is the data counter. So we've got two signals here. We've got the data counter itself, which is counting out the data bits. And then we have the transmit buffer which holds the transmit data. And as the data counter goes on, the transmit buffer gets shifted. So in this case, it's at the state change, my data counter becomes zero, and my data buffer is my input data. Otherwise, if it's not a state change, then we shift right. And that way I can not think about what state this is. There's nothing saying this must be in the data state. Then we're only doing this. We're literally shifting the data anytime in any state. So it doesn't matter that this is not in the data state. We're literally doing this at any state. When we get to the data state, I'm going to be like, oh, the signal is relevant. And at the other times, I'm just going to ignore the signal and I'm not going to use it. And so I don't have to explicitly say here, 
in the data state. I just do it all the time. And when the data state comes, it'll be like, oh, okay, this is relevant now. And the rest of the time, it's like, fine, whatever. You can just carry on doing your thing. And I don't care. You will notice that I'm using the board rate done. So this has got a clock enable, which means that the increment will only occur once every big board rate clock cycle versus every single time. And that's important. Now we're going to our state machine. So there's there's a few things to notice about the state machine. First off, it's asynchronous and it's case current state driving next state. So the only thing that gets driven in the state machine is the next state. There is no other signals that are being driven in the state machine except the next state. And for every single case I have, if my condition, then go into another state or stay where I am. And that is the pattern I follow through the state machine. So when you look at this, it's very easy to see, okay, exactly where you're going and exactly why. So I go, okay, when I get new data, then I get to the next state. When my board counter is done, I go to my data state. When my data is done and my board is done, then I go to my parity state. And when my board is done again, then I go to my stop state. And when my board is done again, then I go to my wait state. And this is asynchronous which means that it's combinatorial logic. So my next state is, is driven immediately with the value that it's gonna take next. And then a default state is next state is equal to current. And that's just to avoid a latch being inferred because with this, you have to cover every single case. So you always have to have if else, if else, and it's only ever next state being driven. Every single state next state has a new value and I don't have to sit and pick with my eye which variables are doing what. It is clearly laid out this is going into this next state now. So this is lining up. It's saying I'm going to line up all my combinatorial logic, I'm going to line up all my signals and I'm going to say I'm lining up to go into this state next. And then in this part of the code, I'm saying, okay, I previously decided that I was going to go into the next state. And now that next state is becoming my state. So there's a two stage process to this preparing to go into that state and then being in that state. Those are the two parts. Next state is where I prepare to go into that state and current state is where I am. What's nice is that you can predict state transitions. So you can say, oh, I'm, I'm in this state and I'm lining up to go into the state. Or I came from the state and now I'm in the state. And so by doing that, you can actually trigger not only on your current state, but also on where you're coming from and where you're going. And that's really, really useful when you are anchoring key parts to your state machine. For example, now my counter is when current state is not equal to next state. So at the state transition, I can reset my counter. Because the problem is, say for example, you have a state machine and it's got two states or multiple states and two of the states are kind of entwined. So like there may be like some dependencies between the states. Like all of these signals are kind of entwined between the two states. If you want to change the number of clock cycles that one state takes before it moves on to the next one, all of these signals need to be adjusted. But if what you do is you take your states and you anchor them to a framework, then when you want to move one state and another state apart, they're anchored to other parts of the state machine. And that means that you can easily separate them without them being all intermingled. And if you just had current state, you wouldn't be able to do that because you wouldn't know where you were or where you're going to. Okay, so now we say, okay, we've got our state machine. How do I drive my TX? For my other signals, I, I just have normal synchronous process, case, and then either next state or current state, depending on appropriate, usually it's next state. And then I just put, if we're in idle, then I'm transmitting this. If we're in start, then I'm transmitting start. If we're in data, then I'm transmitting my data buffer, but zero. If I'm in parity, I'm transmitting my parity. If I'm in stop, I'm transmitting stop. And if I'm in wait, I'm transmitting idle. You could have one of these for every single variable. So if you had another signal that you needed to drive according to state, you could literally just have case. And with these, you could use if statements. If two states are only relevant, you can literally just be like, if the state, else the state, job done. 
the ready is literally just, if I'm in idle, I'm ready. If I'm not in idle, I'm not ready because I'm busy doing other stuff and that's it. And so usually it's three states. Usually it's deciding where I'm going to go, which is my asynchronous process. And it's like, I have all this information and I'm going to make a decision about where I'm heading to next. Then the second part is registering that. So it's like, I decided that I was going to do that. And now it's time to do that. And now that becomes my state. And then the third one is using my state machine, which is those two key processes or block, always blocks as the framework for driving my output signal or whatever other signals are relevant. And that is it. Hopefully this will be helpful for you to be able to see how we can clearly write a state machine that is easy to interpret. And the reason why I go on quite a bit about clarity in the code is because these designs can get really big and really complicated really quickly. And it's a different kind of mess than normal programming. So you have to be extra, extra diligent and intentional in how you code. And hopefully this can be a good demonstration. So I have put this on GitHub and you're welcome to use it or variations of it in your code. If you want to give it a try, if you want to give the state machine technique a try and see what you think of it. So thanks very much for your time. I appreciate you. Bye.